Psalm 37 this morning. Psalm 37. We'll be reading verses 1 through 11 of Psalm 37. The Word of God says this. A Psalm of David. Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. For they will soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. So shall you dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Delight yourself also in the Lord. He will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he will bring it to pass. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light, and your judgment as the noonday. Rest in the Lord. Wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked devices to pass. Cease from anger. Forsake wrath. Fret not yourself in any wise to do evil. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For you let a little while, and the wicked shall not be. Yes, you will diligently consider his place, and it will not be. But the meek will inherit the earth, and will delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, um, what a timely passage for all of us. Thank you for what Will already shared, Father, and I pray that you would help us to savor the things that be of God, Father, not the things that be of this world. Father, rebuke us, point out our anger, our pride, our selfishness, the way we delight in the things of this life. Father, show us the good that you'd have us to do. Help us to walk in the Spirit. Father, guide us and direct us in your paths. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Psalm 37 is written by David. We do not have any particular background other than we know that he is an old man when he writes it. We find this in verse 25, where he says that he is now old. And it's important to note that he is old because he is giving us a proper perspective on one of the most difficult questions of life. The question that Psalm 37 really addresses is why do wicked people prosper and godly people suffer? Why is it that wicked people seem to have all the power and all the money and all the fun and godly people just seem to be constantly attacked and run over and suffer? David would know of this more than almost anyone. As we've been looking at the Psalms, we've seen how David has been slandered, how Saul has tried to kill him. We have seen um, the Philistines. We've seen all of the problems of David's life continually over and over and over again. And it's important to note that David is now an old man. He has a perspective that is not just through the Holy Spirit inspiring him, but he has a wisdom and a perspective on life that we do not have. Those of you who are older in this room, you look at this world differently than those who are younger. And so we're going to see David's wisdom and perspective on this issue of why righteous people suffer and ungodly people prosper. The psalm in Hebrew is written in uh, following the Hebrew alphabet, much like Psalm 119 is, though it's obviously much shorter. And this would be just more as a memorization device where people could memorize this. And it's important because many of the verses we're going to look at, you probably have already memorized portions of them, are aware of them, because these are things that we need to be reminded of today. He begins in verse um, 1 through 2, telling us not to worry about evil people. He says, fret not yourself because of evildoers. In other words, don't worry, don't fret, don't work yourself up in a frenzy, don't constantly be talking about all that the evildoers are doing. It's so often we can watch the news and we can be consumed with the, if it bleeds, it leads, and all we focus on, on the bleeding in our world. We can become so consumed with the negativity that comes in our politics, the negativity that comes in, in our financial markets, and we can be so consumed with all of the wickedness and evil that takes place. We begin to worry about the future. We begin to worry about the future uh, of our retirement savings. We begin to worry about the world that our children are going to grow up in. We begin to worry what's going to happen in the next election cycle. We begin to worry about wars in Europe, and we begin to worry about drug cartels in Mexico, and we worry, and we worry, and we worry, and it really works us up. He says, don't do that. He also says, don't be envious against the workers of iniquity. Now, this is something that we don't say out loud, that, but takes place within our hearts. We envy many times the people who live lives of sin. 
I've talked to young ladies who are sexually pure, and they're very frustrated because it seems like all the guys go after the girls that are sexually promiscuous. And there's kind of a, a jealousy there that they get the attention, they get the dates, they get the people pursuing them, whereas I get ignored. Sometimes it's the opposite, and, and, and guys who are trying to follow Christ and trying to respect women see all the women going after the frat guys, and they're going, like, why, why is it this way? Like, why do I always get the short end of the stick? You may be in business, operate in integrity, and yet the other salesperson lies, but he makes the most sales, he gets the bonuses, he gets the promotion. We see this throughout all of life where we look at people who are living ungodly lives and it always seems like they're not the ones who get cancer. It's the person who sacrifices their life to serve Jesus. They're not the ones who can't pay their bills. It's always the person who's a, a, a missionary serving Jesus. The person who always does what's right seems to get the short end of the stick. And you know what he says? Don't envy the success. Don't envy the money. Don't envy the wealth, the fame, the power. Don't envy all the things that the ungodly have. You know why? Verse 2, they will soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. When I was younger, uh, we grew up next to a hayfield. And y'all, y'all see the thistles that grow that kind of get like four feet high. They're, like, they're, they're miracles to me of God's ingenuity because there's no engineer in the world that could design out of those cells a, a plant that could grow that high and have that bulb at the top. But you know, as a little boy, when you have a baseball bat, guess which, which weed gets whacked? The tallest one. We didn't go through the hay field swinging a baseball bat. But if there was a stick or anything and we saw one of those thistles, that was the first thing that got smashed. You know, weeds grow really fast, and they also die really fast. It is very easy to see how someone does what is wrong and see them shoot up and to go, man, I wish I had it. God, how come you don't ever do that for me? Just as soon as they spring up, they will be cut down. The tallest weed is the one that gets whacked first. Yes, they may have temporary success, but it will not last. Consider the end of the way they're, they're going with their lives. Don't worry about evil people's success. Do not be envious of it. In verse 3, he gives us what to me is just the whole, the whole gist of what you should do in light of this dilemma. That is, trust in the Lord and do good. I, mean, I love that. That's just such a simple life. I mean, it, it's really just the hymn, trust and obey. That's it. That's the whole of Christianity. Just trust God and do what he tells you to do. One of my, my favorite verses growing up, uh, when I had so many theological questions, which now I have more theological questions than I did when I was growing up, but as a kid, you have all these questions about God and theology and, and all of these things. One of my favorite verses was in Deuteronomy, I believe it's chapter 29, verse 29. You know what it says? The secret things belong to the Lord. What is revealed belongs to us and our kids. In other words, there's going to be a lot of things that you're not going to understand. Just trust God to take care of them. But there are going to be things that you do understand, and that's your responsibility to do them and pass on to your children. So often we go, I don't understand what God is doing. Well, let God do it. Okay? You just do what you know you're supposed to do. I love this idea of, of trusting God because so often I, I like to think that I trust God, but in all honesty, my prayer life kind of betrays that I don't because I continually stay up worrying and praying continuously over and over and over again. God, take care of this. God, why don't you take care of this? God, would you please take care of this? That's not what you do when you trust somebody. You know what you do when you trust somebody? You say, hey, can you take care of this for me? And then you go do what you are going to do and you let them take care of it. That's what he says. Tell God all the problems and then go do what he told you to do. Go obey him. We all know of so many things that God has called us to do. Why are you worried about other people? You can't change them. All you can do is do what God has called you to do today. So many of us spend so many hours talking about what we would do in Washington. You don't live in Washington. You are not a senator. Unless it's the week before the elections, save all your worry 
and just obey Jesus. You can't do anything about it. Why are you worried about the war in Ukraine? Are you going over there to fight? Then why are you worried about it? Just do what God has called you to do for today. God will take care of world affairs, I guarantee you. And He can do far better than I can. God will take care of politics in Alachua County. He'll take care of the mess with, with, with the power plant and GRU and all that. He'll take care of all of that. You can't do it, and even if they gave you the problem, you wouldn't know what to do with the problem. Just trust God. You just do what He's told you to do today. You just focus on what He has called you to do. You just focus on reading the Word of God, praying, sharing the gospel, loving your wife, taking care of your children, loving your neighbor, sharing the gospel, worshiping Jesus Christ. That's what you're supposed to do. God has not entrusted all those things to you. He'll take care of it. Trust Him and do good. He explains even further. So shall you dwell in the land, and truthfully, truly, you will be fed. Well, what does this mean, dwell in the land? Well, the children of Israel came and they took their land from the Canaanites. And from then on, they were constant in fear that someone else would come and take what they took. Okay? Philistines. The Philistines were a big problem during David's reign. They constantly kept invading during Saul's reign. That's what Goliath was. There was a constant fear of the Philistines because the Philistines would come in. You remember reading about David's mighty men and how the Philistines came in, would take their food? They would come in, they would take their land, they would take their food, they would do all of these things. And so they were constantly worried about foreign invaders coming and taking their property. And he says, no, God will take care of you. You just do what God has told you to do for today. He'll make sure that you keep your home. He'll make sure that you keep your homeland. By the way, why did they lose their homeland? Because they quit trusting God and obeying him. That's why they lost it. Well, what about food? We in America have, have so much food, food security, we don't even know what, what it's like to be hungry. But going through Haiti this past week, like those people know what it's like to not know where your next meal's coming from. And you know what he says? Don't worry about it. Jesus said that, by the way. He said, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow's got enough problems. You know what? Seek first the kingdom of God and all these things. No, not, not Ferraris and mansions. Food will be taken care of. He promises to meet your needs. You just focus on what he's called you to do and you let him take care of what he has promised to do. And he will be faithful. In verse 4, he tells us to delight in God. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. We all know this verse, and, mo and, and, and let's just be honest. We know this verse because of the second part, because it tells us we'll get whatever we want. And that's why everybody likes this verse, because then God will give me what I want. That's not what this verse is talking about at all. This verse is really about people who are worried about how the, the, the wicked prosper and the righteous suffer, and he says, don't worry about the, the wicked's prosperity. Don't worry about your suffering. Just find happiness in God, and God will take care of everything else. That's really what it's about. You remember we talked about this a couple weeks ago, about finding happiness in God, about seeking to find happiness in Him, not the things of this life. Listen, the things that you want, if God gave them to you, you still wouldn't be happy. It's just the truth. One of my favorite passages in the New Testament where it talks about God, uh, maybe it's in the Old, God answered their request but sent leanness to their soul. In other words, the children of Israel wanted meat, God gave them meat. And you know what? They got sick of the meat, and they weren't any happier than when he gave them meat. They were hungry. God gave them manna. And you know what they said? How long do we have to eat this stinking stuff? The problem was not with God and his provision. The problem was with man. There, there, I, I tell couples this all the time, you know, single people, the worst thing that ever is being single. There are a lot of married people that wish they were single. And you know what? There's a lot of married people who go, the worst thing ever is being married. There's a lot of single people who would love to trade places with you. But you see, we get in our mind that if I can just have this thing, I'll be happy. No, you won't. 
If you want, said, man, if I could just get this hundred acres, I could hunt and I could fish. No, you could be fixing fence line during hunting season and not hunting because that's what you do if you owned all the land. Man, if I could just get this car, yes, it will break down and you'll complain about how much the parts are to fix it. My brother-in-law's dream car was a BMW. He got it, drove it for a year and sold it because it cost too much to repair. You think that if you had it, you'd be satisfied. No, you won't. Man, if I just had money, you'll never have enough money. Elon Musk still works. The only thing that will satisfy you is God himself. Seek to find happiness in God. And when you have him, and you are happy in him, and you are satisfied in him, he'll take care of everything else. That's what it's talking about in verse 4. Okay? He'll give you the desires of your heart. Well, one, if you're delighting in God, what do you desire? God and what he wants for your life. If you're delighting in God, you're not wanting a Ferrari. This is not a verse. When I was a kid, I really wanted a Ferrari. Man, I want an F-35 Spider. That's what I wanted. And it's like, man, here's my verse for my Ferrari. No, it's not. That's not what this verse is about. If you find happiness in God, he'll take care of everything else. Delight yourself in the Lord. Verses 5 through 7, he encourages us to lean fully on God. He says in verse 5, commit your way to the Lord. This, this literally is roll your way onto the Lord. Okay? Um, this, this is what we would use in vernacular today is full send. Okay? In other words, there's no holding back. The way I would describe this commit your way to the Lord, um, how many of you have ever had like a heavy load in the back of a pickup truck and you didn't want to get it out because it was heavy, so you just dropped the tailgate, put it in reverse, gunned it, and then slammed on the brakes. And then just watch the load just shoot out the back of the truck. That's this word commit. Okay? It, it, is, it is jump off the cliff. That, that's literally the word. It's roll, like roll. Like put all of it. Put your entire weight on it. He says take your entire life and say, here you go, Jesus. You take care of it. That, that, that's, that's faith, by the way. Is trusting your eternal soul to Jesus Christ, trusting that his death on the cross was sufficient, trusting his resurrection from the dead secured your standing before God. That's faith. He says, commit your way. Let God take care of and direct your life. Commit your way to him. Don't worry about tomorrow. You just follow what he's told you today. And by the way, this requires a lot of faith. Because what I've found is, is, is as I want to go from here to there, and so, okay, okay, God, and you know what God tells me? He doesn't tell me to go that way. He tells me to go that way. I'm like, God, don't you understand? I want to go there. But you know what? If I take him and I follow him, you know what I'll find? Is he will eventually lead me to where I need to be, but it's never the path and direction that I thought it was supposed to be. It's always up a hill that I never saw and down a hill I never saw. It's always through one thing and through some difficulty or through some blessing that I never saw coming. Yet he always brings me to where I need to be. Like a blind person, I can grab my, and put my hand on his shoulder. And though I think I'm supposed to go that way, and when I feel myself going that way, I can trust him. And I can trust him with my eyes closed that he will always lead me to where I need to be. That's what he tells us to do. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust him. And you know what he says? He'll bring it to pass. You know what it doesn't say? And he'll do it right away. He will bring it to pass. In his timing, not yours. He will bring it to pass. God will do what he has promised to do, but he will do it when he wants it done, not necessarily when you want it done. So trust him. Put the entirety of your weight on him. Just let it be on Christ and Christ alone. Verse 6, he continues this idea of trusting. He says, He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your judgment as the noonday. This is why David is such a good person to write this. You know, as, as I was thinking about David being an old man and how his perspective changes things, you know, when you're two years old, one year is half of your life. When you're a hundred years old, one year is one percent of your life. When you are young and, and you think of something like six months of chemotherapy. Like, that's just horrible. How many of you think of 2020 is last week? The older you get, the faster time flies. 
And when you're young and you're David and you're running from your father-in-law in the army who's trying to kill you, guess what? It seems like it's never going to end. Now David's an old man, been a king for many, many years, and he looks back on that time in his life and is like, you know, that really wasn't that bad. You know, yeah, it was, it was kind of a, a bad, dark time in my life, but praise God it didn't last very long. Do you think David in the cave thought that? No. But old man David looks back and goes, God's got it under control. He had it under control all the time. You see, what happens is when we, when we are in these circumstances where we're going to see the wicked prosper, and we see our own suffering as believers in faith, as believers in Jesus Christ. You know what begins to happen? We're kind of like, God forgot about me. Like, God kind of forgot about all of his promises. God forgot about me. God forgot about my family. God forgot about us. Okay? You know, like, 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 God promised to take care of us. But look, look at all the problems that we have. And what we begin to do is we begin to go, why on earth am I being obedient? Why on earth do I keep doing what's right if I end up getting the short end of the stick? Why am I continuing to be honest at work if all it does is keep me from getting promoted? How many of you all have ever been there, there before? Okay? If you're honest, you don't get promoted. If you lie, you do. Okay? If you show integrity, it, it means you get passed over okay, for the job, but if you have no integrity, then you get it. Like, like we, we see that. But you know what he says? There's going to come a time when all of your faithfulness to God will be seen. When God will see and make, show, make the whole world see that you were right. Do you feel like David maybe was wondering, like, how on earth, like, like Saul's chasing me. He's slandering me. He's turned the whole country against me. I went from a hero to public enemy number one, but I didn't do anything wrong. You know what? Every single person today, when they think of King David, do not think of publicly, public enemy number one running from Saul. What they see is the man who was victorious over Saul and maintained his integrity through it all. His righteousness signs like the sun outside right now. It shines like the Florida sun. No one looks back on David's life and goes, oh, God must have forgotten about him. No, what do we tell our kids about David? Look at how God protected David. Look at how God delivered David. Look at what God did in David's life. Look at everything that God did for David. Do you think that David always felt that way? No. But what you realize is an old man as you know what? God was there all along. And yes, the sun rises and yes, the sun sets. But you know what? There comes a day when the sun rises and everything and all of your faithfulness will be seen. The truth will come out. You will be vindicated. Your reputation will be saved. God will protect you. Just trust him and do what he's told you to do. In verse 7, he says, rest in the Lord. The Hebrew word for rest here can actually be translated as be quiet. Now, that's harsh. I like to complain. I like to grumble. And you know what he says? Just be quiet. Just be quiet. You know, how, how is this resting? Well, I, I can just speak for myself. Um, you know, my wife can attest to this. A lot of times I keep her up late at night grumbling. When I could just say, you know what? God's got it, and we could get some more sleep. That may, I, I've lost years of sleep grumbling and complaining. It's the truth. That's what we do. You know, you watch the news before you go to bed, and instead of going to sleep... You grumble and complain for two hours, okay? And he says, you know what? Just, just be quiet. Stop complaining. Stop grumbling. God's in control. Rest in him. Be quiet in him. Give it to him. He will take care of it. But then he says the part that we don't like. Wait patiently. He's going to take care of it. It's just not going to be on your timetable. God has kept every promise. He just doesn't keep them when we want them kept. Okay? His ways are better than our ways, though. Trust him. Lay it at his feet and go to bed. This morning in my devotions, I read about Jesus okay, on the lake when the storm came. How on earth do you sleep in a boat that waves are crashing on top of your face? I do not know how you sleep like that. I mean, how you sleep on a boat, period. But when there's a storm coming and literally water's filling the boat, you know how you sleep that way? Because you trust God completely. You're not worried. 
God is going to sustain you. Notice what he says. Wait patiently for him. Again, fret not yourself because of him who prospers in the way. Don't worry and don't get yourself worked up about people who are doing ungodliness and seem to prosper. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about the man who brings wicked devices to pass. Until Jesus Christ returns, there are always going to be wicked, evil people. And you know what? Most of the time, the wicked, evil people are going to have power. They're going to have wealth. They're going to have popularity. They're going to have an audience. They're going to have all of the things that you want. But don't worry about it. Trust God. He's going to take care of you. He will rectify all things. Verse 8, he tells us to avoid anger. This was so helpful for me. I I love this. Cease from anger, forsake wrath, fret not yourself in any wise to do evil. This could also be translated, it only leads to sin. How many of you have gotten worked up about something and ended up doing something stupid? That's every single one in here. All of us have gotten worked up over a situation And that getting worked up led to us lashing out, sometimes at our closest friends or spouse or children. It led us to saying things that we regretted and should never have said. It it led us to do things we should never have done. Okay, He says, don't get angry about what's going on in your life right now. No, I appreciate what Will said. It is really hard to see what's happening in our world and not let your frustration build and become angry. It really is hard. But you know what? What does getting angry do? All it does is ruin your day. You do realize that you being angry at this president or any previous president does not cause them to lose any sleep. It's true. There are people today that are still mad at George Bush. And you know what? He still was president, finished his term, and is relaxing on his ranch in Texas. All it's doing is ruining your life. There are people who are still mad at Barack Obama. And all it does is ruin your life, not his. All it does is ruin your family's Thanksgiving. He had a great one. There are people who are mad at Trump, mad at Biden, mad at Pelosi. And you know what? Your anger just ruins your family reunion, not theirs. All it does is ruin your marriage. Your anger and frustration that you bring home from work and take out on your kids does not affect your boss. It ruins your relationship with your kids. The anger and frustration that you have from somebody else that you take out on your spouse only ruins your marriage. It doesn't ruin the life of the person you're angry with. So stop. It doesn't do you any good. Okay, Your anger is accomplishing nothing but making you a moron. And I speak from my own personal experience. Somehow I think that if I get angry... I can change the world. No, all it does is ruin the lives of the people around me and make me a bitter person. That describes, by the way, most of our country. Listen, your anger will not pass a bill in D.C. and will not stop a bill from being passed. Leave that in God's hands and go home and love your wife, love your kids, Okay? Share the gospel with your neighbors. One of the best things you could do is turn off the news. That's one of the best things you could do. You know, when the, in the, the Facebook algorithms, I had a friend who was involved in that. And what that means is that the, the, the stuff you see on your Facebook feed, when somebody puts the angry emoji, it makes it five times more likely to be on your feed than when someone puts a, a, a thumbs up because they know that people feed into anger. And you will stay on Facebook longer if you're angry, which means you'll see more ads and they'll make more money. If you are angry, you will continue to listen to politicians and continue to watch the news. So guess what they put before you? The things that make you angry. 
It doesn't do you any good. It benefits them. Okay? Cease from anger. Okay? Stop being giving in to wrath. Okay? Don't allow your temper to lead you to wreck your life and the lives of others. Don't let your anger destroy your relationship with Jesus Christ. In verse 9, he says, evildoers will be cut off. They won't be cut off because of your anger. They will be cut off by God himself. But those that wait upon the Lord, they will inherit the earth. Instead of being angry at what is taking place in your family, what is taking place in your workplace, your neighborhood, our county, our country, instead, why don't you let God be the sovereign ruler of the universe and you just be his servant and do what he's told you to do? God can handle things far better than you can. Just wait patiently. He's got a lot of moving pieces to consider other than just your opinion and my opinion. And he's going to move all of them perfectly to his designed end. We've already read and seen his designed end in Revelation. We, we saw it this morning what Will read. Everything is going to work out for those who love God and are the called according to his purpose. So let God do God things and you just obey. Wait patiently for him. Okay, the evildoers will be cut off. God's people will inherit the earth. Listen, there will come a time, and I don't know what the new heaven and new earth will look like. I don't understand all of that. But there's going to come a time when you will stand where Congress used to be, and you will laugh that you were so worried about what 100 people did and that used to be chamber that's non-existent because the governments of this world have become the governments of our God and of his Christ. Look forward to that day and focus on what God has called you to do for today. All the things that you worry about now, you will not even think about when you're in heaven. We will inherit the earth as believers in Jesus Christ. Verse 11, or I'm sorry, verse 10. Yet a little while and the wicked will not be. Again, he says a little while. A little while for an old man is a long time for a young man. But you know what? I remember as a kid thinking that, that Bill Clinton's presidency would never come to an end. I, I do. Like, I remember that as a little kid. And then, and then I look back and I'm like, I feel like Bill Clinton was president for like five minutes of my life. Okay? And, 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 and again, whichever president or politician or what political party or whatever it is, what, what, co what co-worker, boss or whatever, you had that horrible job for six months and it seemed like an eternity. It was six months. You, don't, you, you know, there's going to come a time you're not even going to remember that boss's name anymore. Why? Because it's, the, the wicked are not going to last. God is going to prevail. Yes, it may seem like right now that you are going through difficulties and problems. But you know what? There's going to come a time when Jesus Christ writes it all and you won't even remember the names and the situations. You're going to remember and go, man, why, why did I hate that job? And your wife's going to look at you and go, I don't remember. I just remember you couldn't stand it. I don't, I don't know. Well, I'm glad I'm not there anymore. That's what's going to happen as you get older, as you keep trusting the Lord. There's going to come a time when you will consider, and the wicked will not be. You'll consider his place, and it will not be. But what will happen? Verse 11, the meek will inherit the earth. Okay? To be humble and leave things in God's hand is meekness. To say, you know what? I will take all that which is in my power, and I will let go of it, and I will leave it in God's hands. I will let him take care of it. And you know what? This is what Jesus tells us about in the New, New Testament, that the meek will inherit the earth. This is what it means to trust God, okay? To trust him and will delight him, themselves in the abundance of peace. This is twofold. Yes, there is coming a time when Jesus Christ establishes an earthly kingdom that is marked by peace. But you know what the fruit of the Spirit is right now? Peace. So many of us get ourselves worked up over the triumph of the wicked, that we quench the Spirit of God and the peace He gives in our lives. And we live lives of anger and frustration and bitterness as opposed to lives of love, joy, and peace. Listen, you need to humble yourself. You don't have it all figured out. If you had it figured out, 
they would make you ruler of the world. Nobody's even sent you an invitation yet. That means you don't have it figured out. So just do what God's called you to do today. That's, that's what this is about. Yes, there is evil in this world. And yes, in, in, the, in the race, we're the tortoise and the wicked man is the rabbit. And yes, he is way ahead of us. And you look and say, man, I'll never catch up. No, God's in control. Trust him and do good. So here's, here's just a couple questions that I would have in conclusion. One, are you trusting Jesus Christ? First and foremost, for your eternal soul. Do you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sin and rose again from the dead? Are you trusting in Jesus Christ alone for your standing before God? If not, you need to repent of your sin, repent of your self-righteousness, and believe in Jesus Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, are you trusting God? Are you trusting him for your children, your grandchildren, your finances, your country, this world? You know, as I thought about this trust, I was thinking about this past week, that, that when I uh, began working construction, I was, I was a naive Christian at 18 years old. I'd been homeschooled, went to a private school, and then I got a job working construction. And it was my job to lead a group of grown men to clean up a job site. And so I had like 10 guys. I was like, okay, while you five guys, y'all sweep out this room, pick up all the garbage. I'll take five guys and we'll go over here and sweep. And so I went in there and man, we worked and we cleaned up our room. And I walked back and there were five guys leaning on the shovels in the rooms that hadn't even started. And it just blew my mind. Like, how can you tell a grown man, hey, you're getting paid to pick up garbage Here's the garbage you pick up. But then I realized I had to sit there and watch him because you couldn't trust them. But you know what I do? I sit there and watch God. I do. God, here's the situation in my life. Oh, God, God, don't forget about that. Don't forget about that over the corner. Oh, 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 did you see that over there in the corner, God? Did you see that? Don't forget that. Oh, 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 you missed a spot back here. Come on back here and get this one. No, you know what I can do? I can say, God, here's my problems. What room do you want me to go clean? And I can leave all my problems with him, and he'll take care of them. Are you actually trusting God with your marriage problems? With your, with your son-in-law, your daughter-in-law? Are you trusting God with your mother, with your father? Are you trusting God with your finances? Are you trusting God? Are you constantly having to worry and fret and go over and over and over and over and over in your mind how you got to fix everything? God's big enough to take care of it. And he'll do a far better job than you, and he does not need you looking over his shoulder. Which brings me to the last question. What is it that God has called you to do? Do it. That's it. People go, what, what does it mean to walk in the Spirit? What it means is the very next thing you know God has called you to do, go do it. And when you have done it, Ask God, what is the next thing you want me to do? And you go do it. And when you've done that, you say, God, what is the next thing you want me to do? And you go do it. That's it. That is the whole of the Christian life. Trust God and obey him. Is there something that God has called you to do that you are refusing to do? It may be someone that you need to go and reconcile with. It may need to be someone that you need to apologize to. It may be someone that you need to share the gospel with. It may be a conversation with a family member that you need to have. It may be some sin that you need to turn from and confess. What is it that God has called you to do? Guys, there is so much evil in our world. You know, as I was sitting there in, in Haiti talking with the pastors and, and listening to them, you know, I, I could feel myself just kind of taking on all of their worries and, and, and forgetting about the fact that I have a bunch of worries back at home. And, 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 and as, as I thought through all of the problems, listen, guys, there is enough problems in this world for you to never sleep the rest of your existence. There is enough problems in this world that if you just said, I'm going to name the problems in the world, you would talk from here until you die, just naming them. God's in control. 
God can take care of it. You just do what he's called you to do. I was talking with one of the missionaries that was there, and he talked about how he got burnt out. He's working 90 hours a week as a missionary. He said, you go out all day and share the gospel and minister to the poor, and then you come home and they knock on your door all evening long. And if you don't help them, then you are the worst person that's ever been on the face of the earth. And so what he would do is he would meet with people literally from sun up until they went to bed seven days a week. I can relate to that. But then he began to realize, I cannot save the world. I cannot save that country. I cannot save that city. I cannot save that community. And he began to realize, I can't even save myself. All I can do is trust God and do what he's told me to do right now. That's it. Would you trust God today? And would you do what he has called you to do? Amen.